heritage we have here. So let's turn now to number 592, Jesus Calls Us. Jesus calls us o'er the tumult of our lives while restless sea. Day by day his sweet voice soundeth, saying, Christian, follow me. Jesus calls us from the worship of the seated. Please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, to our text, which is Exodus chapter 3, verses 13 through 15. We are in the process of studying the names of God, a fantastic study, one that has gone on, as you know, for many weeks, and yet one that is a totally inexhaustible subject. We're dealing with God himself and with his character when we speak of his names. God has multiple names in scripture. We've been looking most recently at the seven compound names of Jehovah. And last week we began our study of the first of, or excuse me, the third of the seven names. The name Jehovah Nisi. The name Jehovah, of course, is found in our text there in Exodus chapter 3. But we see that as we move over to Exodus chapter 17, just 14 chapters from the point where God introduces himself, or we might say he reintroduces himself to Israel, just 14 chapters later, he gives to us another one of his compound names using the name Yahweh or Jehovah, and that is Jehovah Nisi. And it's in the battle with Amalek, as we read last week. In that battle, when Moses' hands were held up with the rod of God in his hands, Israel won the battle against Amalek. When he got tired and lowered his hands, Israel began to be defeated by Amalek. So Joshua and Hur stood on both sides of Moses and lifted his hands up until the going down of the sun, and Israel discomfited, as the text says, Amalek. And then we read these words. The Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. Now Joshua had been there. But God wanted it to be passed down generation to generation. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nisi. For he said, Because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. A continual warfare. And as we saw, this is written in the book. This is where God expounds his name, Jehovah, our banner. That's a war banner. It's what leads the troops into battle. Fascinating, as we began that, we saw that this is one of the nails that God has pounded into the wall of history 
where we're supposed to hang our memory so that we will remember God in this form of his character. Jehovah, our banner. It's a military picture of leading the troops into battle. Jehovah himself is the banner that leads us to war. The reason he tells us that, as we remember him by that name, is so that we will not be afraid. We pointed out last week something that most folks are not aware of, but God calls himself a man of war. Jehovah is a man of war. The Lord is his name, and that is his name which is a memorial forever. The Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. He shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. He shall cry, yea, he shall roar. Yea, he shall prevail against his enemies. We noted that the name Jehovah is directly associated with the warrior status of God in fierce battle by the name Jehovah Nisi. And this portrays Christ in Revelation 19 where he's on the white horse and he doth judge and make war and his name is called the word of God and he has a name written on his thigh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is our Lord Jesus Christ who is portrayed by the name Jehovah Nisi. We saw that it was necessary to have a single standard to follow so that the troops would be kept safe from division, kept safe from confusion, kept safe from destruction. You know the old saying, divide and conquer. And that's what Satan has sought to do over the many centuries is divide and conquer. And sadly, he's been able to do that in church after church, denomination after denomination. He's been able to divide and conquer because they have begun to follow other standards than the one standard that God himself has set. There have been divisions in the Bible Presbyterian denomination. There have been different standards that have been going different directions. There are those who are following a different standard today and seeking to go back and join with compromising groups. Very dangerous, that brings the destruction of the army. We must have a single standard so that we can single-mindedly follow our leader. I think that helps us to understand why Moses made that altar and called it Jehovah Nisi, the Lord, our banner. God is the authority who has established the standard of his word. Write it in a book. When it's written in a book, it's not subject to failed memory. It's not subject to failed oral tradition. When it's written in a book, and God himself commanded it to be so, and when God himself preserves that book, we have a single, absolute standard which we can follow and thus win the victory. We have the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. As we look at the Bible being portrayed as a sword and the fact that we are commanded to be engaged in spiritual warfare in Ephesians 6, we need to understand that this is the sword which countermands the world, the flesh, and the devil. The Bible prohibits double standards. We looked at many verses last week which specifically say God does not permit double standards. And so as we looked at those verses, we learned three basic principles. I hope you remember these. Number one, there must be an ultimate single standard or banner. Number two, there must be an authoritative source or benchmark for other smaller standards. You have to have a benchmark. Number three, there must be a carefully preserved standard if it is to maintain its authority from generation to generation. It must be preserved. Otherwise, it no longer has the same authority as the initial standard. That brings us to part two of Jehovah Nissi, where we begin today. 
Bible Preservation and Standards. Now, this covers five major doctrines concerning the Scripture. We'll only mention briefly four of them because we're focused on preservation today. But there are five key doctrines that relate to the Scriptures. Number one is revelation. Number two, inspiration. Number three, illumination. Number four, preservation. Number five, translation. Every one of those are key and essential doctrines if you and I are to have an authoritative standard in every matter of doctrine and practice. If there are holes in any one of those five doctrines, you will not have an authoritative standard and you will not have a standard by which you can please God. This is serious issues and this is what is contained in this name, Jehovah our banner. The one who leads the troops into battle, the one who, who does not deviate right to left, the one who has given us his word so that we will know which way to go in our battle. It is our standard, it is our banner. Jehovah Nisi. Dear people, how often we are led astray because we have accepted some deviation in the standard that God himself has revealed as a part of his character. He is the standard and he has revealed it to us through his word. Preservation is a very important doctrine. But first let me define those others for you quickly. Revelation first comes to us. God has revealed himself. We would not know him had he not revealed himself. There is no way you can reason your way back to the God of the Bible. Men reason their way back to gods, which are not the gods of the Bible, but are made in the likeness of men, rather than men being made in the likeness of God. Those are all foreign gods to the God of the Bible. Had God not revealed himself, we would be hopelessly lost in darkness. Revelation is the first of the five doctrines. God has revealed himself in three ways, through creation, through conscience, and through scripture. That's the theme of Romans chapters 1, chapters 2, and chapter 3. In Romans chapter 1, Paul says, the invisible things of him, speaking of God, from the creation of the world are clearly seen so that they are without excuse. Creation reveals enough about God so that the pagan who looks at creation is without excuse. His mouth will be stopped by that. It's enough to judge him. How much of our so-called intellectual society comes under the judgment of God in Romans chapter 1, where creation reveals God enough so that man can be judged? And when man takes and perverts the revelation that God has given through creation, and begins to worship the creature, he turns to all the horrible things that we see today, and Paul lists them at the end of that text, including sodomy, which is now prevalent in our country. That's what happens to those who reject the light that God has given in creation. We get to Romans chapter 2, and we have God revealing himself through the human conscience. Yes, men are responsible in their consciences for knowing God. Paul says... The thoughts of the man as he does his various activities either condemn him or approve him. He knows right from wrong. That's what the conscience is all about. God has built into men that they know that certain things are wrong. Now you can sear your conscience. You can shut your conscience down. But everyone is born with a conscience. The third way is Romans chapter 3 where God has revealed himself in scripture. Not only for judgment, not only for showing him right and wrong, but God has revealed himself clearly in his word. So that every mouth will be stopped, Paul tells us. 
Not one will be able to stand and say, oh, I'm okay, and I figured it out myself. So God has revealed himself in those three ways. Man has perverted those three ways. He has perverted the knowledge of God in creation through the doctrine of evolution. He has perver perverted the knowledge of God through conscience with humanistic ethics. He has perverted the knowledge of God through scripture, through, quote, holy writings. That includes things like the Book of Mormon, the Bhagavad Gita, the Rig Veda, the Quran, and more subtly, by tampering with the text of scripture. We'll be talking about the manuscripts in a few moments, the Lord willing. Satan has sought to pervert God's revelation in all the areas where God has revealed himself. And Satan uses man's reason to do it. But remember this, revelation always trumps reason. Much of man-made theology, read some of the liberals, is based on human reason. But human reason is corrupt because of the fall. When man fell, he fell in every area of his being. Adam's sin at the fall has been passed down to all of us. So not merely our bodies now experience the effects of the fall, that is, we get old and die, we get sick, we can have damage to these bodies, but it has also corrupted our emotions. It has corrupted our will. It has corrupted our soul, our spirit. But it has also corrupted our reason. Even the most brilliant man has a corrupted reason. Back in 1225 to 1250, there lived a man who was very famous in the Roman Catholic Church by the name of St. Thomas Aquinas. He wrote a book called Summa Theologica, Highest Theology. A bright man, very brilliant man. But in it, he argues that though man has fallen in many different areas, man's reason is still intact. And he can reason his way back to God. That ended up with scholasticism. That ended up ultimately with neo-paganism and neo-orthodoxy and neoliberalism. Horrible things in the history of church. Dear people, man's reason has been corrupted. You must start with revelation. The second doctrine in this group is the doctrine of inspiration. Inspiration is when divine revelation is written down. Now, there has been divine revelation that has not been written down, and we are told that. For example, in the book of Revelation, John speaks about the seven thunders, and the seven thunders uttered their voices, and John said, I was about to write what the seven thunders uttered, and God said, don't write it down. So John knows it, you and I don't. John knew what the seven thunders said, you and I don't. That was revelation, but God told him not to write it down. Writing it down is what we're dealing with when we're talking about inspiration. All scripture, that is all the writings of God, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. We'll talk about the two very important parts of that in a moment. The, the doctrine and the practice. Inspired scripture has a purpose in it. When we're talking about inspiration, where divine revelation is written down in human language, there are terms that describe that. We speak of verbal inspiration, inerrant inspiration, infallible inspiration, confluent inspiration, plenary inspiration, and finished inspiration. Each of those describes an essential character quality 
to the written word of God. Verbal inspiration, that means that every word, every letter, and every part of every letter in the Bible is inspired by God in the original texts. I said even parts of letters. Jesus said, not a jot or a tittle shall pass from the law until all be fulfilled. Matthew 5.17 A jot is a yod, the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. A tittle is a foot stuck onto a letter that changes it into different letters. Not a jot or a tittle shall pass from the law until all be fulfilled. Inspiration extends not just to concepts, not just to general ideas, but to the very words and the very letters of Scripture, according to Jesus Christ, our God and Savior. Concept inspiration is a lie from the devil. There are people out there who say, well, who cares what the text says as long as we get the general idea. God said... Write these words in a book, not give a general idea of what you think. Oh, people, that's where the battle begins. Inspiration. Inerrant means that it contains no errors. God did not make any mistakes when he gave the word to the human authors of Scripture. That is slightly different than the next word, which is infallible. Infallible means that it does not teach error as truth. The Bible does not teach error as truth. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about the infallible inspiration of Scripture. The word confluent means that God sovereignly superintended human authors to actually pen the words. Now we have at least one thing that was written with the very finger of God. The first set of tables of the law, which Moses smashed when he saw the children of Israel engage in a horrible pagan orgy around the golden calf, that was written with the finger of God. But the principal way in which God gave his word was he used human authors who were so supernaturally controlled that they wrote the very exact words of God. God himself had supernaturally controlled their point in history, the point at which a particular father would join with a particular mother and produce a particular child with certain characteristics in a certain culture at a certain period of time so we would have a certain linguistic ability. So that these were natural words that were being used by the prophets as they wrote, but God himself chose the words. God himself had built their vocabularies. God himself was sovereignly at work on every word, every letter, every syllable, every part of the letter. You see, this is God's word. But God chooses to use people, amazing as it seems. God chooses to use you and chooses to use me in sharing the gospel with people who are lost. But the only thing that takes effect is his word. You can argue all you want all day long with an unsaved person. You can use all the reason that you want. But the thing that God has said will not return unto him void is his word. Not our intelligence, not our emotional appeals, not our soft music. The thing that does not return unto him void, but which accomplishes that which he pleases and prospers in the thing whereto he has sent it is his word. And so we have confluent inspiration, God using and supernaturally directing. Peter tells us, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That's a word for irresistible force, moved. It's like taking a, a small stick and throwing it into the midst of a raging river. That stick does not determine where it will go or what it wants to do. That stick is moved by the current. That's the word Peter uses. 
Holy men of God were moved by the Spirit of God. It wasn't according to their own wills. It was according to the will of the Spirit of God. That's the sovereignty of God at work. Then we come to the word plenary. Now, there are a lot of people who, when they do their through the Bible reading, skip over the and so and so begat, 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 and so and so begat. Or the passage that says, He lived so many years and died. 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 You know, there are chapters of that in the Bible. Plenary inspiration means those chapters are as much inspired as John 3.16, which we all know, we all love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's just as inspired as reading that Methan, Methan begat somebody, or Azor begat somebody, or Sadok begat somebody. Did you know that? God gave us those passages for a reason. Now, some of you have heard me preach on this. I preached on it at the youth conference two years ago. How important those genealogies are. Because they tell us something about the real history of the real world contrasted with the pagan philosophy history of so-called evolution and all the pagan documents that are out there. It tells us something about the character of the people because names mean Something. That's why we're studying the names of God. Names reveal character. Dear people, plenary inspiration means that every part of the Bible is equally and thoroughly inspired to the greatest possible extent by the living God himself. God is not redundant. God is not feeble-minded where he had to include something because he needed some padding in the Bible. All of Scripture is inspired. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. What perfection have those, what you might consider dull passages, wrought in your life? How have they helped to bring you to spiritual maturity? Perhaps they need more study, don't they? Then we move from plenary inspiration to finished inspiration. God is no longer giving revelation and causing it to be written down. With the completion of the New Testament canon of Scripture, revelation and therefore inspiration is finished. The last few verses of the book of Revelation make this clear. There are serious warnings to those who would take away from what has been revealed. There are serious warnings given to those who would add to what has been revealed. Curses by God himself on those who tamper with his word. We move from inspiration to translation. Translation deals with accurately translating word by word, not paraphrasing, the inspired text of scripture into another language that is different from the original texts of scripture. Not from defective manuscripts. There is a great plethora of so-called Bible translations available today that are based on defective manuscripts. I'm going to give you some illustrations of that if we have enough time, showing you what some of those translations say in verses when you look at your King James, you wonder if they are even in the same Bible that you're in. Translation deals with exact word-for-word word, movement from one language into another language. That's what's called formal equivalence. Formal equivalence. That is a special method of translation that was used to translate your King James Bible. 
avoid everything that speaks of it as a dynamic equivalent method. For example, and there are Bibles, so-called Bibles, out there that take phrases like, Behold the Lamb of God. Now, to you and me, that's a very wonderful phrase. John 1.29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Did you know that there is a translation into the language of the Eskimos that says, Behold the baby seal of God. Uh. Well, after all, they were just trying to make it relevant. Dear people, God has not called us to monkey with his word. You see, that is what's called dynamic equivalence. That is very, very bad. Because you don't have to try to make the Bible relevant to Eskimos or Muslims. There are a bunch of them today that are trying to translate uh, into Arabic and into other languages and cultures where the culture is Muslim. Things that avoid calling Jesus the Son of God. Because that would offend a Muslim who believes in Allah who is not the God of the Bible, by the way. The Allah of Islam is not the Jehovah of the Bible. But to try to pacify them so they won't get mad and kill you when you hand them a Bible, uh, they use other little phrases to try to get around that. Trying to make it, quote, relevant. That is not the word of God. God is not ashamed of himself. The Son is not ashamed of his relationship with the Father. The Father is not ashamed of the Son. Dear people, avoid anything that calls itself a dynamic equivalence. Modern translations are primarily bad for at least two reasons. There could be many more added to this, I'm sure. But the basic underlying reason in every reasons in every case are one of two things. Number one, they're almost always all based on a defective group of Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic texts. Wrong text, no matter how good your translation, is going to be a wrong translation. Those are based on manuscripts that were changed in the past. Number two, modern translations and all paraphrases frequently use that dynamic equivalence method. Those two issues make them suspect and they make them dangerous. So unless you know Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic, stick with your King James. It's the, an excellent translation of the correct original text. It uses the correct method of translation, which is formal equivalency. Now we move to illumination. This deals with divinely given wisdom and understanding. Remember, revelation, inspiration, illumination, preservation, translation. Five key doctrines. We're talking about illumination right now. That deals with divinely given wisdom and understanding of the written text of Scripture. Illumination is given only to believers and not to unbelievers. Unbelievers can memorize words. Unbelievers might even study and memorize, and some scholars have who are unsaved, Hebrew and Greek. Young Jewish boys throughout the centuries have memorized in Hebrew major portions of Old Testament scriptures in Hebrew. And they have to quote them and recite them at their bar mitzvahs. Now here in America, most of the time they can memorize the sounds, but they don't even know what the translation is. But they don't have illumination. Illumination is the understanding and the wisdom that God gives to his people as his people study the scriptures. He gives them that understanding. He gives them that wisdom so that they might know how to love him, serve him, obey him, and live their lives. Illumination. The first seven verses of Proverbs deal with the doctrine of illumination. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding. To receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity. To give subtlety to the simple. To the young man, knowledge and discretion. You hear all the different words that are tied together here? So that we might understand the intricacies of the word of God 
in a way that is good for us and glorifies our Heavenly Father. A wise man will hear and will increase learning. A man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels to understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. Now listen to where it begins. This is why I say that only believers have illumination, understanding, the work of the Spirit of God in their hearts to understand the Word of God. Verse 7, the fear of the Lord is, that's Jehovah, all capitals, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. You can't get into it unless you start with the fear of the Lord. If you track that phrase, and I did this many years ago, Every place it occurs in Scripture, the fear of the Lord, it always takes you to the point of salvation. It's when the man begins at the fear of the Lord that then God begins to give him understanding of his word so that he can grow in Christ. You can feed a dead corpse food all day long and it will never grow. You must have a living body to make it grow when it is fed. And Job says, Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart, for I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. You are to eat the word of God, to drink the sincere milk of the word as babes in Christ. Paul uses the same illustrations in 1 Corinthians. It is the intake that brings the growth that is necessary for the new life in Christ. But it has to be alive. And the fear of the Lord dealing with salvation is where illumination begins to start as that child in the Lord begins to have an intake of the scriptures and begins to grow in Christ. Illumination. Now we come to preservation. We come to the name of God once again that controls the standards or the banner of God. This brings us to Bible preservation. The standards of God himself, Jehovah Nisi, the Lord our banner. I hope you see how things tie together. I'm giving you this very abbreviated overview so that you will understand what an important name of Jehovah this is. Preservation is directly connected to the name Jehovah Nisi, which we began to study last week. You see, we begin with the ultimate standard of the inerrant, inspired scripture as it flowed from the quill of the supernaturally controlled human authors in the original languages of Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek and has been translated for us accurately in our King James Bible. God has revealed himself. You can't know the God of the Bible unless he reveals himself. He has revealed himself in a book. That is why this is so essential for us to know if we would know the living God. The true God, not a, a God of man's imaginations, but the God who made all things, the creator of heaven and earth. The redeemer who sent his son, Jesus Christ, to be our savior. How important is that? From it is the pure fountain of truth that all mandatory doctrine and practice flows. The standard is the original autographer, that's the original manuscripts which were written by the human authors of the Bible, but it has plenary authority, full authority, that flows from directly from the accurate, correct, exact copies of the original. Let me give you an illustration of what I mean. You know that every day that they're in session, Congress passes more laws that are not only confusing and complex, but usually more burdensome in terms of taxes. They pass those laws. State legislatures pass those laws too. They do it here in New Jersey. And uh, you know that makes our lives more complex here. Occasionally they strike out something that's good and write in something that's bad, and occasionally they write in something that's good and they strike out something that's bad, though it doesn't seem to happen that way very often. But those laws that as they are passed, they are circulated among the different legislators who read them, 
theoretically, and then vote on them. And so those stacks of paper that are on each legislator's desk become the law of the land. Well, you know, those are the originals. But the copies that are made are equally authoritative when they are accurately and correctly and exactly copied and are put into the law libraries and onto the bookshelves of judges, judges and attorneys. Those are just as authoritative as the original ones that were held in the hands of the legislators as they passed them. These also are authoritative, not merely the ones that are in the archives in Washington or your state capital. And so when we're dealing with the scriptures, God gave his exact word. It was written down. No question, the autographer and most, quote, evangelicals will agree at least that the autographer, that is the original manuscripts which have the ink written by the apostles and prophets, most will agree that those were inerrantly inspired. Where the battle comes is, what about the copies? All right, if those original manuscripts were authoritative for the first generation of Christians, and if they've been copied and translated, copied and translated back and forth and so on down through the centuries, and at each stage they become more defective and more mistakes are being made in them and the copyist was sleepy, he didn't have his coffee that morning, and so he left out a line or he left out a word. Or some guy thought, you know, that's not very clear, I think I'll add something myself, and he sticks in an extra line there. If that's the case, to the extent it is the case, those later manuscripts are no longer authoritative because they contain the words of men instead of the words of God. I hope you understand how serious this issue is. This is no joking matter. And we are involved in these days in a tremendous assault against the preserved text of Scripture. You walk into any Christian bookstore, you'll find a whole section of, quote, Bibles. In many Christian bookstores, you can't even find a King James. But you've got everything else. You've got Latino Bibles. You've got Korean Bibles. You've got uh, Bibles for girls. You've got Bibles for boys. You've got Bibles for teenagers. You've got Bibles that have, you know, fancy covers on them for different cultural groups. You've got all kinds of strange translations. Because, you see, it sells. The love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. From the faith. How do we know the faith? That body of revealed truth that has been handed down to us from generation to generation. The word of God. Those people depart from the faith. How do you have salvation? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Your people, you buy and read and study and believe perversions of scripture, and it will affect your theology, that is your doctrine, and your practice. Well, I see our time is up for today. I still have some very important things to say on this subject because this is how God has revealed himself. Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah our banner, he himself is the one who leads his troops to war. Jesus Christ, who is the leader of that army, is called the Word of God. And it is no mistake that the Bible is also called the Word of God. Do we have an effective leader? who leads us into battle. He is paralleled with the scripture itself. If you have a defective scripture, you have a defective sword, you have a defective leader, Christ himself. You impugn to him that which he does not have, which is error or sin. 
people, I know this may sound hard for you to understand. You must not let go of the Word of God. You must not yield when there are those who would press you and try to get you to compromise on just one little point. I'll close with an illustration. Imagine a water tower. It is full of water. Now, there are ways that you can get the water out of the water uh, tower. There are ways that you can cause water to go into the water tower. You can get a big chain and pull the water tower over and it explodes and spatters water every place and you don't have any use for it. But the way Satan has chosen to attack the scripture, which is our water tower, where all the doctrines are inside it, is he's poked a small hole. And then he tries to turn off the spigot that pumps water back into the tower. Now, with a 100,000 gallon tower and a hole that's only a quarter inch big, it will take a very long time for that water to drain out of the water tower. But eventually it will drain out. The same thing is true if you allow a liberal or someone else to poke a hole in the source of your water, your living water. If you allow them to poke a hole of question and doubt in the word of God, do you know that eventually it will leak out all the doctrines, not just the one which they have attacked? Serious issues. Never let your Bible go. It is the sword of the spirit by which you do battle with the enemy. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. We pray that you will make us faithful to the scriptures. Help us to understand, though it may seem like a strain on the brain to learn something about these doctrines, help us to understand why they are so important. Because ultimately, everything in the Christian life, everything in our system of faith goes back to the word of God, where you have revealed yourself as the one who is our banner. There is a standard, and it is not a fluctuating standard. It is not a double standard. It is not a quasi-okay standard that is fluctuating from one point to another point and deteriorating over generations. Thank you, Father, for your word. Bless it to our hearts, we pray, and to our obedience, in Jesus' name. Amen.